This story is from a woman named Lily, and what a pretty name. You all know I love that name. I've, my dog's name is Lily. The character I write about in a fictional podcast, his name is Lily. His dog, his name is Lily. I don't know why I like that name. I've just always liked it. So thanks, Lily, for sending this story, but let's get let's see what she writes here. It's pretty exciting. I know everyone says that their stories are true. I believe some of these stories are true because I have one of my own to tell you about Bigfoot and an encounter that I had. I was five years old when this story took place. Yes, I can remember things from that age because it still haunts me to this day. At the time, I had never heard of Bigfoot and I didn't know anything about him. My family and I were living with my grandparents in their house in Porter, Texas, which is about 30 miles north of Houston. This happened in 1967, and there was a population of maybe a little over 300 people. We had no TV at my grandparents' at this time. All we had was a radio, so most of the time we were outside playing. One night, we were all sitting in the living room listening to my papa play his harmonica, and I had to go to the bathroom. Well, I went in and did my business, and as I was about to leave the restroom, I heard a noise at the window, which was to my left. I had to look up to see the window because it was taller than I was. When I looked up, I saw a giant hairy face looking back at me through the window. Well, I screamed as loud as I could, and everyone came running to see what had happened. I told them that there was someone looking at me in the window. My papa and my father and my older brother grabbed their guns and ran out back to see whoever was outside. They came back after a little while later and said that they didn't find anyone out there. And I told them that there was someone there, but no one believed me. The next morning, they took me outside and they said there was no way anyone could have been looking through the window because it was too high for anyone to look in unless they were standing on something to see and there was nothing around for anyone to stand on. There were no footprints either. It was built three house blocks high off the ground, which is pretty high, and the window for the bathroom was another six feet higher than that from the house blocks. I know what I saw that night, and it took me a long time before I could go in that bathroom by myself again. I remember the face that I saw that night. The window was like a medium-sized window, and the face covered almost the whole frame. Its face was hairy, but not all of it was covered in hair. You could see around its eyes and its forehead and its nose was big and it was kind of fat, but not like a gorilla. The hair that I saw looked dirty and matted and its skin was dark, but I'm not sure how dark it was because it was nighttime. Then in 1976, my papa passed away. He passed away in that same bathroom that I had seen the face in the window. Everyone thought that he had had a heart attack A couple of days later, I overheard my grandmother telling my mother that the coroner said that he did not die of a heart attack and that his heart was fine, and he said that he had been scared to death. So I knew that Bigfoot had come back to the house, and I'm now 60 years old. I do not tell anyone my story because I was made fun of as a teenager. Oh my gosh. Number one, you know... Girls are modest. They don't, someone peeking in a bathroom and they're, you know, I I don't want to get into that, but they're, you know, that happens. And to be a little five-year-old girl and look up and see this giant face in the window must have, I can see where it scared her to death. And then this thing about her papa, oh my goodness. The doctor actually said he was scared to death. I mean, this all comes together when she's 60 years old. It's such a good story. It's a heartbreaking story, but it's really good, Lily, and I really appreciate you sending it. It was we. It was a good one to share. I'm not going to say it was a great story. It was a great story, but you kind of know what I'm saying, don't you? Don't you? All right. Thank you, ma'am, for sending it. All right, all right. Thanks for joining the podcast. It's been a little over a week since I put one out on Dixie Cryptid. I have two stories in this podcast. I hope you like them. I've been busy uh, writing and recording some Steve Lilly stories. 
Matter of fact, there are two brand new stories, number 14 and number 15, up on the Steve Lilly channel. If you haven't heard any of those stories, I recommend you start at number one and just listen, kind of figure out who he is and what he's doing and what his crew's doing. But if you have listened before and you're familiar with the podcast, 13, 14, and 15 are consecutive stories. In other words, they're kind of continuations of each story. And um, So if you haven't listened to those, jump over there and look at it. I'll put a little link in the description, maybe put one on an iCard. Anyway, I just wanted to tell you that I enjoyed writing the last two, and I'm in a writing mode right now, but I also have a lot of work to do in my regular job, so some of these podcasts on Dixie may be just a hair shorter than they normally are, but I'm going to try to keep up with everything because I love doing this, and I appreciate all your nice comments and your encouragement. That's enough of me talking. Let's jump into these stories. All right, here we go. All right, this story happens in Texas. I love stories from Texas. The writer doesn't give their name. They do, but they don't say whether to use it. You know the drill on that. But here's what they write. I grew up on a cattle ranch in East Texas. My family had hunting ranches in Texas Hill Country where I developed my love of camping and fishing and hiking and rock collecting. Although I have never physically seen a Bigfoot, I have definitely experienced Bigfoot activity. For the last 25 years, I've taught music. Four years ago, I was teaching in a small town outside of Kerrville, Texas, where I was able to rent a vacation cabin that I had stayed in once on a holiday. I sat on 26 acres of hill country wilderness, and although it was only a one-bedroom, it was enough for me and my two dogs. I loved the land and the wildlife around the cabin. I probably spent most of my paychecks on feed for the whitetail and the axis deer. There were a couple of ornery wild donkeys who benefited from that feed, too. Well, I fed scraps to families of foxes and raccoons, and I had several turkeys on the place. Once I even saw a bobcat less than 50 yards from the cabin. It was a paradise of wildlife. And best of all, the place was loaded with fossils. I spent a lot of time hiking and fossil hunting during the three years that I lived there. Not everything that happened there was a good memory, though. In 2016, I began to hear things hitting the side of the cabin at night. And at first, I brushed it off as an armadillo or a wild hog rubbing against the cabin. And then one night, I was lying in bed watching TV with one dog lying beside me and the other one asleep on the floor. And something slapped the wall next to the bed so hard that it rattled the pictures. We all three jumped up. I grabbed my pistol and turned on the outside lights and took a seat in my lazy boy chair with the gun pointed at the door. And both of my dogs were spooked. Seeing them act that way put me at even more on an edge. One was a pit bull and the other was an Australian shepherd. They weren't the kind of dogs to act nervous. I spent an uneasy night trying to keep the dogs calm while occasionally picking out the windows and waiting for something else to happen. At that time, I wasn't thinking about Bigfoot. I figured someone was trying to break in on me. For my own safety, I put up a game camera facing the side of the house that was slapped, but I never got pictures of anything except for foxes, and I got plenty of those. But unfortunately, the owner of the cabin died not long after that. His family wanted to sell the property, and I had to move. I got a new job teaching in Santa Fe, New Mexico. It was a new place and a new adventure. Every spare minute I had, I spent fishing the lakes and rivers and the mountains or hiking the trails all over northern New Mexico. And of course, I was always rock hunting. I even did some panning for gold while I was there. Using Google Maps, I found the farthest place I could fish up the Pecos River in the Santa Fe National Forest. It was called the Holy Ghost Trail, and it was so remote that it was on a one-lane road that wound up the mountain. When I pulled into the deserted campground with my two dogs, they ran straight to the water while I looked around. 
It was a beautiful wilderness area with giant aspens and pinyon trees and cedar trees. The creek ran the length of the narrow canyon between the mountains. I'd been walking around a bit and taking in my surroundings when I started getting this weird feeling. It was like something was watching me. My first thought was that it was a bear or maybe a cougar, so I was on alert the whole time I was there. When the dog started acting strange and even ran back to the jeep and jumped in, I decided it was time to leave. I did some research on the Holy Ghost Trail, and I discovered that some people think it's haunted. Well, I wanted to go back there to pan for gold, but I never got around to it. On a cold winter day in March of 2021, I was going stir-crazy, and so were the dogs. It was during spring break, but spring didn't get the memo. After two years of teaching online, I didn't care that it had snowed the day before. It had melted in the valley, but I was thinking about the mountains and panning for gold. So I loaded up the dogs and head up to the place I'd found on a map called Willow Creek. And that's not the famous Willow Creek. This one was off the Pecos River, not far from the Holy Ghost Trail. It was known for being a place to find a little bit of gold, but it was very remote. I ran into a park ranger on my way up, and we chatted a while, and I told him what I was planning. He pointed out that it was cold up there and that some of the river was still frozen. I said I still wanted to go have a look around, so he pointed me in the right direction, and I headed off. The farther I drove up the mountain, the more the trees felt like they were closing in on the road. The creek formed a valley that I was driving through, and even it seemed to be smothered in the forest. There was no one in sight when I pulled into the small parking area, and the dogs jumped out and headed straight for the water while I took a moment to enjoy the scenery. It looked like a Christmas card. There was still snow on the ground and in the boughs of a lot of trees, and the river was about eight feet wide and frozen, and behind me was a patch of trees, and behind them... The mountain went straight up. It was the kind of place that can make you feel like you're the last living soul on earth. I walked the bank of the creek in the hard snow until I noticed a large set of footprints that looked like they were frozen beneath the ice. Well, I followed them for 30 yards or so until they crossed into the creek and then they disappeared. As I walked alongside them, I took note of the fact that I had to make two giant strides for each single step of the tracks. I stood there and took a closer look at them. The toes didn't show up very well. Where they did, they looked short. As I stood there, the hair on the back of my neck began to stand up, and I glanced over at my dogs and saw that they were staring into the brush. I knew I didn't want them to go in there, so I called them back to me. Then I did a 360-degree turn looking all around me for whatever made those prints. Come on, dogs, I said and I went back to the truck. After I loaded the dogs, I got out my camera and I dug out a tape measure, and then I went back up there and I measured the prints and the strides. The tracks measured 16 inches long and 4 to 5 inches wide, and the strides were 4 and a half feet between each step. I took a few pictures with my foot next to them. My female dog wouldn't stay in the truck, She came over and started walking around the prints, not straying far from me. That was when I started to get a really weird feeling again, like something was watching me. I was so spooked that I decided it was time to leave. I didn't take the time to video the stride along the river. It's something that I now regret. I believe I was recording Bigfoot tracks that day, and until then the thought had never crossed my mind. I had been all through the mountains all my life. Bigfoot wasn't supposed to be real. When I got home, I did some research and I found out how wrong I was. To my surprise, there have been a lot of sightings all around my area and in the areas where I'd been remote hiking for the last two and a half years. and It left me with a lot of questions for which I needed to find answers. I learned that the year I had the cabin slapping incident There was research going on eight miles from where I lived. I went back and looked at the trail cam footage again and discovered something hiding in the brush in some of the footage. 
In another spot, the fox is there, and in the next frame, it's gone. I can make out a face in some frames. It isn't clear until it blinks. In New Mexico, I discovered that Willow Creek, where I found the tracks, is at the bottom of Elk Mountain. That's where a hunter went missing and was featured on the Missing 411 The Hunted series. Was all of this coincidence? I don't know but I tend to believe that something is out there, and I believe it's Bigfoot. I sent the photos that I took that day to Cliff Barrickman of Finding Bigfoot fame and Dr. Jeff Meldrum. Both had the same reaction. Video footage will have provided better evidence. The pictures I sent were inconclusive, but it doesn't matter. I know what I saw that day. I just moved back to Texas near Corpus Christi, and they say there are some sightings around here, and I'm more prepared now when I go into the wilderness. I definitely carry a firearm, and I pay close attention to my dogs, and I'm always ready for a new adventure. Oh, that's so cool. That last sentence just gives me a little peek into this woman's personality. She loves new things. She loves being, uh, she might be a bit of an introvert. And uh, she loves being out in the wild alone with her dogs and just looking around and taking everything in. And she notices things that are different. And she gets these senses when she's out there. Probably not every time, but at least in the, the areas that she described. She gets a sense that something is going on around her that she can't see, but she knows it's happening. And I think that's good intuition. I, I don't know... Uh, I've never had that feeling. I've never had that feeling. Every time I go in the woods, I'm just like, oh, 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 that's a cool tree. That's a cool bird over there. And I never get that sense. And maybe that's because there's no cryptids around where I live. But anyway, I love this story. I love this lady's spirit. I'm so thankful she sent this story in. So thank you, ma'am, for sending it. I think that'll wind this up a little bit shorter of a video than normal. And the next few may be that way, but I'm still going to be cranking them out. I got to work, y'all. I'm trying to make a living. I'm trying to, I'm getting close to retirement. Anyway, y'all, I'll quit yakking. Have a good week. I'll have a podcast up in the next couple of days. I hope you enjoyed this one, and we'll see you on the next one. Thanks. <laughs>